and I saw the trailer for the Rogue Prince of Persia, back of the AAA initiative. It looked pretty slick, but there's a lot more to most games than just a slick trailer. But I'm happy to say that the Rogue Prince of Persia is genuinely awesome. If you like Prince of Persia games, maybe you remember Sands of Time? Don't worry, this feels super familiar. You're constantly climbing up ledges, jumping off walls, getting the drop on enemies, kicking them off of those ledges, vaulting over them to avoid damage, all the things that I remember doing or wishing that I could do in Prince of Persia. And hey, if you like action roguelikes, you like Metroidvanias, you want a little light platforming, well, the Rogue Prince of Persia has that as well, which feels like it draws inspirations from greats in the genre like Ori and the Blind Forest or Hollow Knight, while also doing something that feels truly unique. Now, I've had the Rogue Prince of Persia on my radar for a while now, but I wanted to give it a little more time to cook because the initial early access was a little bit bare bones. So when Evil Empire reached out to let me know that the game was now getting its second act, meaning more zones to explore, more bosses to fight, but also to offer me some hands-on early experience, I jumped at the opportunity. And honestly, I regret nothing. This has been an awesome experience. And if you're looking for an early access game to jump into, I absolutely recommend The Rogue Prince of Persia. First and foremost, the thing that sets the Rogue Prince of Persia apart is the way parkour is woven into the core gameplay. You don't just have a level and some jumps. Yes, there's platforms. Yes, you can jump between them. But you're going to spend about as much time climbing up poles, shimmying down those poles, grabbing the wall and jumping to the next thing to wall run up, or vaulting over enemies to give yourself an edge in combat. This does require some precise timing, and it takes a little bit to get the hang of it. At first I thought, oh, that makes for Rogue Prince of Persia way harder than other Metroidvanias that I've played. Turns out, no, it's really smooth and intuitive. So after a little practice, I found myself easily transitioning between the different zones and mastering some of the new mechanics, at least as long as I'm not on a time pressure. This also requires a shift in thinking, because a lot of the time you're going, okay, I have to jump sometimes, but aside of that's left and right, you know, all horizontal. Now you have to think about the vertical a lot. But in doing so, you get that fun little feeling of, I'm breaking the game, I'm cheating. The devs definitely didn't expect me to kick this guy down three ledges just so I could knock him into a trap. Which, is it practical or worth it to do that? I'll leave that for you to answer, because I would say it's certainly fun enough to justify the extra time. This also leads to the zones feeling very different. So, at first you're fighting in a ruined village. There's plenty of buildings to climb on and plenty of walls to grab onto. The second zone you're very likely to enter is the aqueducts. Now, there's a lot of flowing water, and you can slide down the flowing water, you can kick the enemies into the flowing water, but going back up is a lot more difficult. You're moving against the current, and it wants to pull you back down. Then, by the time you get to the game's third and fourth area, all of a sudden, there's a lot more traps. There's some plants that you definitely can't trust. They look like a pole. They're going to suck you in. And there's a lot less to grab onto, restricting your mobility options and making the combat more difficult. So it's pretty fair to say that not just the enemy difficulty, but also the environmental difficulty evolves as you go through the different zones. Because for example, instead of starting in a village ravaged by the Huns, maybe you want to start directly in their camp and go raise some hell. You can do that, and it means you'll encounter some new enemy types for your troubles. But alright, jumping and climbing is fun and all. How does the combat work? Well, it is very dynamic, because the Prince is able to do several things to interact with and disrupt enemies. First up, you have your attack, normal and special. Now, the normal attacks feel pretty similar. Yes, some weapons are faster, other weapons have longer reach. Where things get really interesting is the special. For example, 
One special might be that you'll throw your weapon. Another empowers it with fire, allowing you to deal elemental damage. With a third, could cause a big AoE slam that damages everything around you. Each weapon having a unique special goes a long way to make each of them feel very different and cater to a wide variety of personal playstyles. But in addition to that, you have a couple more tricks up your sleeve. The first of which is the dash and the vault. You can use the dash to cover distances while climbing, and you can use the vault to jump over enemies, giving you iframes indicating some of their attacks. Then after you've vaulted over an enemy, maybe use your kick to knock them off the edge. This kick can also be used as part of some of the boss encounters, and it can even be used to block slash reflect enemy projectiles back to the attacker. Now that's a lot, and you might be thinking, okay, so this is too much for me. I want something simpler. Don't worry, despite it seeming like a lot, it's all very easy to get into. After a couple runs, I found myself getting into that flow state, not even thinking about the fact that I was using my kicks or I was vaulting over enemies. It just flowed really, really well. And once you're a little more comfortable with things, you can also use your tool. This is a second equipable item that the Prince has. It might be a bow to attack enemies from a distance, or it might be a grappling hook to pull enemies to you, stun them, and give you a perfect window of opportunity. I found that the tool isn't super necessary, but there are definitely times where it's very handy, so when you're comfortable with the rest of the systems, start incorporating it into your combat. Now, in addition to this, you have the medallion system. This is somewhat equivalent to the boons from Hades, temporary buffs that you get within the run. But here, Evil Empire has done something really clever, because throughout your run, you get random medallions and you can swap between them. You also sometimes get opportunities to either upgrade an existing medallion or unlock a new medallion slot both of which are increases in power that make your build better. But to do this, you also have to sacrifice one of your existing medallions. So you need to choose, do I want two weaker bonuses or one stronger bonus? The one stronger bonus is absolutely better in the long term, but sometimes it can feel really bad to give up a bonus that you're relying on right now. At first, I kind of hated this. Like, why do I have to give up the boons that I'm already using? But again, after a couple runs, I came to like it very quickly because I realized not only can I use this to get rid of some of the meh boons that I didn't really want anyway, but also this forces me to pay a lot more attention to the boons that I'm taking. Especially if I have spare medallions, I don't want to necessarily open them immediately and sort through. I might want to hold on to it a little bit, sacrifice for a mediocre bonus, and replace it with something really good after I do so. At the beginning, your medallion selection is pretty simple, but as you collect cinders throughout your runs, you get to talk to Pachi and unlock new sets of medallions, and some of them are really cool. Like one that allows you to throw a bunch of knives when you use your weapon special, and if you enhance it, now you throw flaming knives. And this does incredible burst damage that will just melt through chunks of boss's health. Or you can get a legendary medallion that increases your health when you use environmental kills. See, I told you there was a reason to kick that guy down eight flights of stairs just to knock him into a spike trap. Others award you for skillful play, like a medallion that gives you a crit chance bonus, provided you're striking enemies from behind which gives you often more incentive to not only vault over them, adding a good little bit of injury to insult. So now that I've talked about how combat works and the basic gameplay loop, I want to get into a few events, because the zones aren't just static. Different things happen within them. For example, you might encounter a shop, and you might not have the money to buy anything, which normally would be pretty annoying. Okay, you don't have the money to buy anything, the shop's wasted. Or maybe if you're lucky, you can go and backtrack to the shop after you get a little more money. Well, the Rogue Prince of Persia makes this very easy as well, because throughout the map there's going to be wells, and you can use these wells to travel anywhere within the specific zone. So if you need to backtrack to that shop, that's fine. Just keep clearing, go ahead, get some money, teleport back, buy something, and continue right where you left off. This feels really, really good, and it actually encourages me to explore a lot more than I would otherwise, because I'm not worried about, okay, if I go over there to explore, I have to now backtrack all the way find the area, explore a little bit, then backtrack all the way through the level and leave. You know, I just take a quick well, I teleport, I explore a bit, and then I teleport right back to where I started. In addition to this, you'll also find parkour gauntlets, where you need to avoid a bunch of obstacles, climb up a lot of walls, go around things, and you'll get a treasure at the end. These can be quite valuable and often give you the blueprints you need to unlock new weapons or medallions. Other times, you'll come across an event that's tied to the main story. For example, I found this Hun Shaman trapped in a cage. All right, well, he seems uh, surprisingly friendly, and he asked me to track down the Book of Heads to use it to free him. So that's exactly what I did. I explored the map, I found a Book of Heads, teleported back, 
only to find out uh, he was already free. See, I told you he was friendly. So after a short conversation, he heads back to the Oasis, where he becomes one of the vendors. In this case, he gives you rewards for defeating a certain number of a given enemy. And then he continues to give you even more rewards if you're able to defeat them in more complicated manners, such as killing an enemy and then killing an enemy using one of their own attacks. So far, I really haven't felt the need to grind this out, but hey, it's free stuff that happens occasionally, and I'm totally fine with that. Other times, you could come across a challenge event, such as this one, where a small child is going to be sacrificed in a hunting ritual. You have to get to the end of the ritual and destroy the source of corruption to be able to rescue a child. If you succeed, you'll get a wealth of rewards. If you fail, well, you might lose some health along the way because, at least if you're me, it's very easy to take a lot of extra damage while rushing during the parkour sections, but also you will know the sting of defeat because you could have saved that child and you are a terrible person. Needless to say, I failed quite a few of them at first and felt pretty bad about it, but after a little practice, I succeed more than I fail. But if you're able to master all the parkour challenges and defeat the regular enemies, as you progress through the zones, you're also going to come across bosses, such as Beirut, the game's first boss. And I'm just going to show you what the fight looks like so you get an idea. And to give you an idea of what a boss fight looks like in The Rogue Prince of Persia, I'm just going to play it now, fully uncut with no dialogue. So yeah, that was kind of a lot, but boss fights really encourage you to think about the terrain and use it to your advantage. So for example, Brood often stomps the ground releasing a massive shockwave. Now, you can try to jump over it, but in some cases, the shockwave is too big and you won't be able to. So instead, you need to jump, grab the wall, hang for a second, and then slide down after the shockwave safely pass. Also, sometimes she jumps into the air before crashing down and uses a variety of attacks which you need to avoid. And occasionally, when she does this, her attacks are so strong they break the landscape. When this happens, some rocks appear. And these rocks are going to be a little bit of a theme throughout the boss fights, because you can kick those into pretty much any boss where they appear, stunning the boss, interrupting any move they happen to be doing, and giving you a perfect window of opportunity to deal damage. Now, initially, I struggled a bit with the fight. Once I realized I could start kicking rocks, oh man, it got so much easier, and I was able to take her down on the very first try where I discovered that. But really, the boss that impressed me the most was the second zone's final boss, Batar. This guy amped the environmental interactions up to 11, as he starts to use the very room where the fight takes place against you. So, 
First up, he's going to use a lot of AoE attacks, whether it's a big old eye laser or causing beams to sweep across. And for these, you very often need to use the environment to your advantage, such as line of sighting the eye laser behind a solid structure. But during his transition phases, darkness roils up from below the battlefield trying to consume the prince, and you need to climb all the way up to the next location to continue the battle. This is a great example of a way that the Prince of Persia leverages its parkour system to create boss fights that feel truly unique because the closest thing I can think of is actually a boss fight from Ori and the Blind Forest, which takes place in a tree and water is constantly rushing up and Ori needs to escape. But in that case, the entire thing is more of a challenge gauntlet where you're not actually fighting too many enemies, you're just going up to escape the rushing water. Here, you alternate between fighting a boss, doing the boss's mechanics, and also escaping the rushing darkness. So in short, I'm pretty impressed with a boss design for the Rogue Prince of Persia. And by the way, no, I haven't covered all the game's bosses. There are more. I'll leave those for you to discover. But no matter how well you do, eventually your run's going to come to an end. And that's when you get to turn in any cinders you've collected and sent back to the Oasis on the game's various meta progression systems. Now, I already talked about one of these, which is unlocking new medallions with Pachi. Similarly, you can unlock new weapons and buy upgrades to weapon rack, meaning more weapons are offered to you have a certain run at the forge. Or you can go collect extra cinders after you've helped a certain Hun shaman. In addition to all of these meta progression systems, you also get skill points. At the start, you only have one skill tree, but you can spend cinders to unlock additional treats, such as the value tree, which enhances the value's breath mechanic. You can kind of think of this as a kill slash climb streak that empowers the prince, provided he's able to rapidly defeat enemies or rapidly parkour across a bunch of obstacles. Then later on, you get the Mithra tree, which enhances a lot of the shops and various vendors. For even more cinders, you have the Halma tree, which I strongly recommend unlocking as soon as you can and maxing as soon as you're able to unlock it. It grants things like increased maximum health and extra potions that make it much, much easier to progress through a run. It was after I unlocked the Halma tree but I found that I was winning far more of my runs than I lost. In addition to this, after you win a run, you'll unlock a new system that allows you to opt into even more difficulty for, of course, new increased rewards, some of which can be contributed to more skill points later. But after that, it's mostly a matter of slowly unlocking everything, progressing the story, and of course, getting better at your parkour so you don't fail quite so embarrassingly next time you try to make that jump. So with all that said, what's the burden? There's a lot of content here. So much so that I feel like I've barely scratched the surface in my 11 or so hours of gameplay. I also love the way this feels so much like a Prince of Persia game, while still being a really good action roguelike, and how blending parkour into the combat makes bosses particularly different. You're not just looking at a singular enemy that you must defeat. Instead, you're thinking about how you can use the various elements around the room to avoid their attacks and turn the terrain against them. I would say it takes just a little bit of getting used to, after a few runs, though, the gameplay is so smooth and fluid that you'll be cruising through in no time. In short, I strongly recommend The Rogue Prince of Persia, and I think it is very much worth the $20 price of entry. But, personally, I don't think I'm going to continue with the game right now. That's because I want to experience this game when it's a complete title with all the content with a final boss, and so I can progress and unlock all the storylines instead of just getting halfway through and then needing to wait. That said, when the game hits 1.0, I am absolutely going to come back and play and honestly probably reset my save file to do so. And so, if you want to see my thoughts on the game then, do be sure to get subscribed, ring that notification bell to see future uploads, and hey, you made it to the end of the video, you probably liked it, leave a like while you're down there. Also, a big thanks to Evil Empire for sending me a key. I had an absolute blast so far, and I can't wait for 1.0. With that said, I was reminded of another game as I was playing through the Rogue Prince of Persia, especially with how the game handles its parkour and environmental interactions, that game being Ori and the Blind Forest, which is my favorite Metroidvania ever. So if you want to see my thoughts on Ori and the Blind Forest, maybe you're looking for something else to watch after this, click through to my review up in the card and down below. For now, thank you very much for everyone who watched to the end. I'm glad you've enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one.